Joshua chapter 11, verse 1. When Jabin, king of Hazor, heard of this, he sent word to Jobab, king of Madon, to the kings of Simran and Ekshaf, and to the northern kings who were in the mountains, in the Arabah, south of Kinnereth, in the western foothills, and in Naphtoth, Dor on the west, to the Canaanites in the east and west, to the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, and Jebusites in the hill country, and to the Hivites below Hermon in the region of Mizpah. They came out with all their troops and a large number of horses and chariots, a huge army as numerous as the sand on the seashore. All these kings joined forces and made camp together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them because by this time tomorrow, I will hand all of them over to Israel, slain. You are to hamstring their horses and burn their chariots. So Joshua and his whole army came against them suddenly at the waters of Merom and attacked them. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Israel. They defeated them and pursued them all the way to greater Sidon, to Misrephath Maim, to the, and to the valley of Mizpah on the east, until no survivors were left. Joshua did it to them, as the Lord had directed. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots. Now, Joshua chapter 11, we are talking about the battle between uh, the Canaanites and Israelites. Now uh, it is time to uh, attack the northern kingdoms. We covered uh, this. First, uh, the Joshua conquered um, the middle, Gilgal and Jericho and Ai and Gibeon. And then they attacked the southern kingdoms. So Jerusalem, Jarmuth, Hebron, Lachish, and Eglon. Those uh, southern kingdom allies attacked and they defeated, the Israelites defeated. Now it is time to uh, go up to the uh, northern kingdom. So after finishing this uh, the center and the southern kingdoms, and um, they are going to attack the northern, toward the uh, northern kingdoms. When I read uh, this story and over and over again, it gives me uh, something, some idea that has happened in, uh, during the Korean War. Back in 1950, as you know, uh, the Korean War broke out. As you can see, the General MacArthur is a commander of the Allies. And uh, there is a story of Operation Chromite. It's uh, the occasion that out of sudden, uh, the condition of the war is converted, reversed. Before going to that, General MacArthur, he died uh, 19, uh, April 5, April 5th, 1964. And at the moment, the New York Times had this, this uh, published in April 6, 1964. MacArthur leaves a spiritual legacy, prayer for his son. It goes like this. Build me a son, O Lord, who will be strong enough to know when he's weak and brave enough to face himself when he is afraid, one who will be proud and unbending in honest defeat, and humble and gentle in victory. 
Building a son whose wishes will not take the place of deeds, a son who will know thee, and that to know himself is the foundation stone of knowledge. Lead him, I pray, not in the path of ease and comfort, but under the tra uh, stress and spur of difficulties and challenge. Here, yeah, let him learn to stand up in the storm. Here, yeah, let him learn compassion for those who fail. Build me a son whose heart will be clear, whose goal will be high, a son who will master himself before he seeks to master other men, one who will reach into the future, yet never forget the past. And after all these things are his, I add, I pray, enough of a sense of humor so that he may always be serious, yet never take himself too seriously. Give him humility so that he may always remember the simplicity or true greatness, the open mind of true wisdom, and the meekness of true strength. And this uh, prayer ends like this. Then I, his father, will dare to whisper, I have not lived in vain. Such a great uh, poem and uh, prayer. And like this uh, a certain uh, prayer, and I admire that maybe General MacArthur, he got some impression when he reads uh, the Joshua, uh, the conquering moment, the battle between Israelites and Canaanites, and he got some idea how he can uh, conduct the war, um, the Korean War. So briefly, let's see what has happened. The Korean War broke out. This is a 38 parallel. And here, the North Korea invaded South Korea. And all the way through, it was a devastating. This small portion of uh, South Korea, they could survive. But to convert uh, this battle, there's an amazing attack right here. This is uh, called Operation Chromite. The land, landing of operation and all the way through the uh, northern uh, part of the Korean Peninsula and hit the uh, Yalu River. But because of the sad, sadly, because of the communist, uh, the Chinese Communist Army, they just came by and we had to uh, uh, give up Seoul area again. And now um, this is kind of a tug of war and not pretty much a progress. So back in uh, 1951, and there's uh, some uh, negotiation uh, between, and out of sudden, uh, 1953, 53, and July 27, the armistice, the truce, so technically, the Korea is still at war now. It is not uh, the end of war, but just, okay, let's take some rest. So this is not the end of war, but uh, they just uh, put on a hold and halt in this situation. So as you can see, uh, just like the Operation Chromite, now, uh, Israelites, they attack middle and south and now north right here. So these are all kinds of uh, uh, geographic uh, information. So you can see right here, this is a, a Mebrom right here. And this is a Sea of Galilee. Uh, back then, and they call it uh, Gineret, right? So the same term, like Sea of Galilee and Kinnereth right here. Right here, Akshaf right here, and Shimron 
uh, Tyrang and Sidon right here. So the battle is going on. The Hazor is one of the biggest cities. And uh, according to the Bible, it's ahead of uh, those kingdoms. So the archaeologists, they found out uh, this site and they dug out and they found like this um, Hazor. Hazor right here. And maybe this uh, staircase about uh, um, 4.5 uh, meter wide and it's about uh, 15 feet uh, wide and um, these are back in uh, Solomon's, King of Solomon's era. But uh, those site uh, is the Hazor. And as we can see, uh, Joshua chapter 11 and verse 10, at that time, Joshua turned back and captured Hazor and put its king to the sword. So uh, he killed it. And he says, uh, Hazor had been the head of all these kingdoms. It's a huge city, incomparable uh, with Jericho, Jerusalem. Some scholar says it's about uh, 20 times bigger than the uh, city of Jerusalem like that. So huge city and they have uh, chariots and they have horses. In today's term, uh, they have uh, armored vehicle and tanks, those. And a lot of people, I mean, a lot of army. But uh, Joshua was not afraid because God was in his sight and he doesn't have to worry about even if they, he saw a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of people and army. And um, back to uh, verse 4, it says, They came out with all their troops and a large number of horses and chariots and a huge army as numerous as the sand on the seashore. All these kings joined forces and made camp together at the waters of Merom, to fight against Israel. When I read uh, this text, something really hit my mind uh, in New Testament. You know, the story of this battle, the book of Joshua, it implies a journey toward heaven. We are heading for uh, the heavenly Canaan, and the battle we are doing, we are engaging in the spiritual battle on this earth. And this is not very simple battle because we are fighting against our sins and fighting against some dark enemies and the power of darkness. And this is today's battle. It's, it's an ongoing process. This is a Bible text overlapped of uh, those two Bible texts. Because this battle is not only for the battle during the Joshua's time, but it's ongoing process of the battle toward the end. This is the last moment, end time event. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, it says, Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to his testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. Only English Standard, Standard Bible version has, uh, and he stood on the sand of the sea, and nothing like uh, New King James Version and uh, NIV. Uh, interesting enough, those versions they don't have uh, this, and he stood on the sand of the sea. Probably a different uh, transcript they translated. But just uh, summarize those two, uh, Joshua 11 and uh, Revelation 12. Joshua 11 verse 4 has a huge army as numerous as the sand on the seashore. In Revelation 12, he says, And he stood on the sand of the sea. 
And also uh, Joshua 11 verse, four, uh, verse 5, All these kings joined forces and made camp together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. And again, Revelation uh, 12 and verse 15, The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth. So as you can see, uh, the, the, the word uh, sand, each side, and the water in each side. This implies that this battle is not only for the Joshua's time, but it's an ongoing process. You and me, we are fighting against the evil uh, spirit and for, uh, until the end, until the end time, and it's, it's going on. Like the battle of uh, the coronavirus, right? It's an unseen the virus, little tiny, but still devastating. And the, the sin problem and uh, the power of evil, darkness, pretty much the same. We are waging in a spiritual battle. But don't worry. There's some good encouragement right here. In Joshua 11 and verse 6, it says, the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them, because by this time tomorrow I will hand all of them over to Israel, slain. You are to hamstring their horses and burn their chariots. Like that. In Joshua, this expression repeats many, many times. Do not be afraid of them. Do not be afraid and be courageous like that. Yes, we have to listen to these words every day. The battle that I won yesterday does not guarantee the battle today I could win. No, I need each day daily support from our Lord. And we should read this Bible text over and over, over again, renewed our mind. Okay, God said, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid and be courageous like that. So each time Bible text gives us, Bible text gives us a very good encouragement and each time we, we have to renew our mind with our um, Father's words because we are living day by day. Not necessarily that I won yesterday, not guarantee that I will win today. But good news is that whenever, anytime, if you are with your God, and the victory is guaranteed. Amen? And verse 11, Everyone in it they put to the, uh, to the sword, they totally destroyed them, not sparing anything that I breathed, and he burned up. Hazar itself. So, like this, the message is that uh, when we destroy uh, those cities and those men and even infants, we have to do, we have to follow uh, according to God's will and God's command. And totally, he says, they totally destroy them. Yes, that's true. We have, we have to uh, we have to destroy them uh, totally, annihilate those, because God says so. But there's a story that uh, when uh, King Saul, he didn't listen to God's words carefully. Let's go back to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, and verse 3. It says, Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, and cattle and sheep, and camels and donkeys. But Saul, King Saul, he didn't follow this uh, instruction because this is what he did. Uh, verse 9, But Saul and the army spared Agak and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. The, this they were unwilling to destroy completely. 
But everything that was uh, despised and weak, they totally destroyed. Sad, sad moment because rather uh, he was uh, listening to God's command, God's order. He thought, I have a better idea. And he thought, uh, those are good uh, sheep and um, uh, those are good things he spared and saved those and even uh, the king, Agak, he saved this king because he, he just wanted a trophy because he won this game in, in this war, right? But it was against God's will. And surprisingly enough, Bible history tells us some good lesson. After uh, around the 600 years, and this is what has happened, the time of Esther, right? After 3 and verse 1. Very, very interesting here. Uh, there's a man called the Haman. He appeared here, and he says, After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamedatha, the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. Wow. Listen carefully. Agagite, the descendants of Agak, somehow the descendants of Agak, uh, they were spared. And after 600 uh, years, and now the arch, they, he, he became arch enemy to Israelites, like this. In verse 13, he says, uh, Dispatches were sent to couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and um, annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and little children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adah, and to plunder their goods. Look at this. Annihilate all the Jews. When, when King Saul failed to annihilate, annihilate uh, those uh, Agagites, the Agak, uh, descendants of Aga, and in the future, 600 years later, now, this is an opposite uh, situation now. The Agagite uh, Haman is going to uh, destroy all the uh, Israelites, Jewish people, because Saul failed to annihilate uh, the Agag right here. Wow, this is really a serious uh, business right here. It seems to me if I can take care of my sin today, defeat the, my weakness today, who knows? Generation after generation, it'll be handed over to the next generation. And all kinds of suffering my descendants would get. Guess what? Just like a coronavirus, you know, uh, South Korea is one of the uh, uh, good nation. Um, I mean, some uh, good uh, news reports came uh, out of uh, South Korea uh, in terms of taking care of uh, the coronavirus. And uh, initially, it was uh, really hard to control uh, these viruses, this virus, COVID-19. But as time goes on, it's subdued, and uh, they were under control. And I believe uh, a daily new cases, about uh, less than 10 uh, new cases a day. But all of a sudden, something happens. Korea, uh, Korean society, I mean, the government decided to ease the social distancing. And I mean, uh, they just allow to go back to uh, normal business. So uh, one day, this whole area, uh, there is a uh, club, a uh, bar, uh, something uh, drinking, a uh, binge drinking uh, occasion has happened in Itaewon, one of the center of uh, Seoul metropolitan area, very famous 
uh, business dis district for tourists. And just a single night, and now the new cases jumped up to uh, 94 new cases um, nationwide. Korea is a very small country, but uh, the numbers just jumped. Okay, let's um, let's uh, let's take a let's uh, uh, watch some uh, supporting um, the video clip. A new outbreak of coronavirus cases in South Korea has sent officials scrambling to stop its spread in the densely populated capital city of Seoul. Officials reported over 30 new infections across the country as of midnight on Sunday, the highest daily numbers in more than a month. The country has been lauded for its early action in slowing the pandemic, but on Sunday, President Moon Jae-in warned of a second wave. It's not over until it's over. While keeping enhanced alertness till the end, we must never lower our guard regarding epidemic prevention. Most of the recent infection cluster was linked back to a slew of clubs and bars in the popular nightlife district of Itaewon, many of which cater to members of the LGBTQ community. That has raised complications for officials desperately trying to track down new infections in a nation where open homosexuality is often taboo and LGBTQ people still face significant discrimination, including job loss and hate speech. Authorities had tested 4,000 people, but were still trying to track down around 3,000 more. Seoul Mayor Park Won Soon has pleaded with clubgoers to be tested, warning that anyone avoiding testing could be fined. The next two or three days will be a critical moment which decides if Seoul will be infiltrated or not. If Seoul was infiltrated, the Republic of Korea will be infiltrated. The outbreak has prompted Seoul to impose an immediate temporary shutdown of all nightly entertainment facilities, just as the country began easing some social distancing restrictions last week. And authorities have proposed to delay the reopening of schools, which was scheduled to begin on Wednesday. So my point is that uh, um, when we put our guard off for the time being, and this thing will happen, the virus strikes back like this. When we um, lose, a, lose my, our mind and um, absent-minded uh, action can cause all kinds of invitation from the evil spirit, the Satan is going to attack us again. And this is another uh, serious kind of a very uh, concern. I'm very concerned about the community uh, infection. In May 12, 2020, United Airlines, a doctor, his name is uh, Ethan Weiss, uh, took this picture while he was uh, coming uh, back home from uh, New York City, uh, from uh, Newark Airport, uh, New Jersey, to SFO. Uh, Dr. Weiss is an associate professor at uh, UCSF. Uh, Cardiovascular Research Institute. He's returning after spending two weeks treating patients uh, in New York, New York uh, Presbyterian uh, Hospital. But as you can see, all packed and no room, and they are not uh, practicing any social distancing in packed airline. In coronavirus, we are fighting this moment. It's a very serious of virus right here, and all kinds of uh, symptoms we can expect in brain stroke and pink eye and loss of a smell and taste and blood, unexpected blood clotting, and gastrointestinal uh, system vomiting and diarrhea. It will be caused, and as you can see, the respiratory uh, problems are lungs and heart and weakens heart muscle and causes dangerous heart, um, probably heart attack and kidneys and damage to structures that uh, filter waste from uh, blood and patients often require dialysis, very, very uh, serious. And skin, as you heard, uh, COVID uh, tore, uh, toes, 
like this, and the finger is a purple rash from the attack on blood vessels. So the immune system, when the whole immune system collapsed, then it'll be done and people died. Wow. You can give me the lesson. Unseen battle, either coronavirus or the evil, evil spirit. We have to put the full armor to protect us, to fight against this uh, evil uh, spirit. This is because of uh, Deuteronomy 20 and 16. However, in the cities of the nations, the Lord your God is giving you as, your, as an inheritance. Do not live alive anything that breathes. Because this is a lesson that in a battle, if I don't kill you, you will kill me. The enemy is going to kill me. In a battle, there is no such thing like kite game. Like, uh, unlike the soccer game, it can be uh, ended in a uh, tight score. Score is uh, zero to zero in a draw game. But in a battle, and also the spiritual battle, if I can't defeat, or if I couldn't defeat the evil spirit, and evil spirit is going to uh, devour me and devour you. That's why we need uh, this full armor. As you can see, uh, Ephesians uh, 6, 11, there's a term, uh, full armor appears here. Put on full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. So, you know, the devil's, uh, the battle between uh, us and devil, we are not fighting by uh, ourselves. We need a full armor of God. And 14, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness, righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the redness and comes from the gospel of peace, 16. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the, Lord, uh, which is the word of God. You know what? After this, verse 18 is very, very important. To have this, th there's a connect connection which, which can connect everything. That's prayer. Verse 11, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. I strongly urge you that our lives have to be filled with the life of prayer. We can't live without breathing. We can't live without uh, praying. Uh, the Facebook, uh, one of my friends just sent me uh, very interesting uh, comments from the Facebook and the, the, the pastor Spurgeon, right? And he, um, he was asked that which one is more important, the reading of Bible or prayer? And this is his answer. Well, which one is more important, the breathing in or breathing out? Both important. And I hope uh, you get uh, this message today. And we have to put our full armor to, to fight against the evil spirit. And the victory will be with us. And have the God's word in your heart. And with this word and prayer, we can move on. And the victory is guaranteed. And we are fighting. We are fighting. And this is the result is already, uh, we got the result already. It's a one game, right? God bless you. And happy Sabbath to all of you. And hopefully in the new, near future, we can see uh, face to face.